Next we have George Bachelor from Mass DOT. George is a supervisor in landscape design with over 15 years of experience. And he leads a team of five landscape architects who provide design and design review for mascot projects statewide. A lot of people interested in innovation. Uh, I'm going to talk about some things today that I think there are people in the room who actually know more about them than I do. But I want to give you an overview of innovation at MassDOT, what's, what we're up to on uh, some of the projects we have, and some of the guidance that we have for the country. So uh, essentially it's going to break a presentation that's going to break out into two parts versus a couple of what I would call case studies of a couple of remarkable projects that are really on the extreme of what we're trying to do at MassDOT, looking at, struggling with, in terms of new ideas. These are not typical projects by any stretch. These are projects that really have stretched everyone who's been a participant. They are controversial projects. And then I'd like to talk about, um, those are projects that move away, uh, that we're all of us in design are doing out of Ashto references or other kinds of references and into the zone of best engineering judgment, best design judgment, because these are unprecedented in a number of ways. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, the two case studies I'm looking at. Many of you are familiar with these projects. One is the Beacon Street Reconstruction Project in Sunnerville, and the other is the Casey Arborway Project in Geneva Plain in Austin. So, uh, I'm um, show of hands between those two projects. How many people are familiar with at least one? Yeah, yes. Okay, good. Um, we'll begin in with uh, the Beacon Street project. The um, corridor of Beacon Street in Somerville is, per the Somerville website, the most used bicycle route in the city. And this is a city that is considered, at least in the 2010 census, one, the most dense city in New England in terms of population per square area. Uh, I'm also interested in this project uh, at a personal level because I used to live, right? The project purpose, as it's explicitly stated on the website, is to design a state-of-the-art roadway that increases the access, safety, and mobility for all modes in the corridor. Now, it's actually, I've been with MassDOT more than 15 years. I've been in my supervisory position for about 15 years, but I've actually been with the department for over 20 years, and in that time, I've seen an amazing convergence between my profession, which is landscape architecture, and civil engineering, as the values have converged in terms of livability and in terms of there is an overlay between the expectations of engineering safety and livability in the cities. And these two projects are kind of exemplary of those sorts of, sorts of vision. So in the project features of the, um, the, the Beacon Street project, there's landscaping and there are cycle tracks, these separated bicycleways uh, that you heard much about in the previous presentation and for most of you I imagine are familiar with. Um, so I imagine most people are familiar with cycle tracks or as they're becoming known as separated bicycle lanes. Uh, the trick always with these things, which are interesting ideas, these fascinating ideas, is how to make them real. A few years ago the term was concept context sensitivity, and I would say context awareness is still very real, but it's taking on a new meaning. But how do you take these interesting ideas and make them work in places? This is Beacon Street. This is where I live. It's complicated. It's got residences. It's got commercial uses. It's got retail areas, many, many driveways, many different uh, curb cut conditions, many different roadway widths. It's a challenge. So, in fact, as the project has evolved toward its 100% stage, there are actually, I counted them, approximately four different conditions of sidewalk uh, and bike lane and parking and travel lanes. Uh, this will first, what I will call condition one, is starting from the sidewalk. There is a separate bike lane that's actually flushed with the sidewalk, but it's separated by the landscape and utility pole conditions. Followed by, it's at the same grade, you have parking against the curb, and then the traffic lane outside the parking. A second condition, and this is a little more unusual, you actually have grade separation, a slight separation between the sidewalk and then the cycle track. And these are in conditions where actually there is no parking, but you have this mountable curb separation between the cycle track and the travel lane. You have a third condition, which is the more conventional 
uh, street parking with a bike lane next to it, uh, the parking against the curb, and the landscape next up on that on the sidewalk, and condition four, where you don't have bike parking at all, but you have the bike lane right up against the curb. So how does this look? Um, again, the, uh, this is uh, Miller Street. My house was uh, just opposite Miller Street there. Star Market is on the upper right-hand corner on Sacramento Street. And so the proposal for the street here, you can see, um, let's see if I can point this out, I don't know how well, but there's a whole complex of the different arrangements being proposed. The north side of the street has that berm condition, what I would call the condition two, where you do not have parking uh, for the uh, westbound traffic. On the east side, you have the condition one, where you have, okay, are you actually, this is the parking area. There's the bump out, there's the driveway. This green stripe is where the bike lane is, and that's flush and gray, so it drops down for these curb cuts. You have the landscaping between that and the sidewalk, and that continues that direction. Okay, next condition. This is one uh, where the road actually tapers and the conditions change. Again, looking at the eastbound. Oh, we're headed westbound, rather. You're going from the parking with the conventional bike lane here, going up the ramp into that raised uh, bike uh, cycle track condition on the north side and on the south side. Heading east, you're going from your protected or your sheltered bike lane here, transitioning up to the condition where you have um, the uh, bike lane directly against the side. And a third challenging condition, because Beacon Street includes buses as well, is the condition and a right turn um, down Washington Street uh, where the bike lane transitions headed east uh, to the condition of the typical bike park, or the on-street parking bike lane. And then north of the street, uh, headed west, you have the uh, cycles going from the uh, to the... <laughs> bike ramp condition from the typical parking condition. So, a lot of different things going on here. Mix of different bike lane configurations, bigger varying street widths, varying parking conditions, multiple curb cuts and grade shifts, multiple curb conditions, a lot to think about. Not least of which is the fact that some of those taken on a hit for this project of 161 parking spaces. And I can tell you, I used to guard my parking space very preciously out there, and that was before the amount of development that's on there. So I know this is a controversial piece. The other question that comes up that Somerville is taking on is how do you maintain all these different sorts of conditions? Snow removal, litter removal, things like this. These are challenges, and, and I hand it to the city for taking this on. Okay, case number two. The Casey Arbor Way project could take the whole hour, so I'm going to give you the cliff notes of the cliff notes on it. Um, simply put, uh, how many people are familiar with the project just to get a sense of it, the overview of it? The uh, DCR bridges transferred to MassDOT uh, five years ago, this Saturday. Um, and the, one of those, some very nice bridges, and then one or two not so nice bridges. The Casey Overpass was a not so nice bridge final solution for this project instead of replacing the bridge was to put an at-grade solution. A lot of cool things happen with this. The context of this bridge is significant. Of course, it is the missing link of the emerald necklace that actually ties the jewels of the necklace together and terminates the Arbor Way just around the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, that can be extended all the way to Franklin Park. There is also a critical intermodal connection here from the north, you have Southwest Quarter Park uh, coming down to the Casey uh, uh, Pass, but not quite getting to Forest Hill Station, at least in an urban design point of way. You have Forest Hill Station, terminus for the Orange Line, among other things. So taking all this together, removing <coughs> the bridge suddenly opens up a major urban design moment of so many superlatives. It's incredible, and my head spins off on this project. One of the things that's critical is part of this project, if you look at stepping out and looking at the Boston Bike Network, the blue lines are uh, on-road connections, the green lines, and you can see coming down the middle there, that's the Southwest Quarter Park coming into the red rectangle, which is the Casey Harbor Lane project location. And looking closely, you can see it's a gap. The part of the opportunity this project was to connect that gap. 
And what we ended up with is a project at, at multiple levels was a real, I, from my point of view, a revolutionary moment in the history of Boston and its open space. Because you can connect this diagram of the trees actually harkens back to some of the original Olmstead visions for the extension of the parkway to the other open spaces in the area. But what's overlaid on top of this is in terms of a bicycle connection and a pedestrian connection, you have do it separated, a separated bicycle, two-way bicycle facilities and a sidewalk facility on north and south sides of this. This is the most, I, Dan Driscoll just made sure that I knew that this is the most uh, generous accommodation of bicycling and pedestrians in the parkway system in Massachusetts. It does generate some interesting conditions that I'll get into. You can see here the separation of the uh, bike, there's the bike routes on the inside toward the track along the corridor and the pedestrian routes on the outside. One of the interesting conditions is that in the North Plaza, uh, right at the entrance to the uh, Southwest Quarter Park, you have the bike route, uh, which is made out of asphalt, and you have the connection of the Arbor Way to a bicycle connection to the Southwest Corridor Park connection, sort of a T intersection. And who gets priority? There was much discussion about this. How's this going to work out? Behold, the first <laughs> bicycle roundabout, possibly, in the country as the entrance gateway to the Southwest Corner Park, and the connection of Southwest Corner Park to the Arbor Way. This was, uh, this was a very exciting moment for us. Note there is a new orange line headhouse just uh, there uh, in the center of this uh, plaza area. So there's a combination of things happening here. One of the things that gets tricky, you put a combined bicycle, two-way cycle tracks, and you put a separate sidewalk, you come to an intersection, what do you do? You have what we politely refer to as a mixing zone, and vaguely refer to as a mixing zone through the 25%. We'll get it fixed. <laughs> well, we got the 75%, yes, we have a mixing zone. And we're going to get the bikes and the pets, and they're, they're going to do it. There are lots of places like this. The engineers happily really took a hard look at this from MBTA because they have a part of this. Our accessibility folks took a hard look at this. We had peer analysis. We had a whole room full of people take a look at this. And we ended up with a solution that is fairly unique in Boston. One of the things to be aware of, the intersections have separated bicycle and pedestrian walkway uh, point, crossing points. And what's happening here is you'll see those little blue dotted lines there. What is happening? You have to have, a, at the mixing zone, you have to be able to communicate the expectations of what is going to happen here to both the cyclists and the pedestrians, which may include people who are visually impaired. So among the things that happen here with input from our accessibility section and others, you have a series of four different tactile materials going on. You have the bikeway, which is made out of asphalt. The pavement from the sidewalks is concrete. And then in these mixing zones, it's a unit paver, it's an asphalt paver, that allows us to do the following, which is it's a different texture, and it allows us to use a different color so that the cyclists can follow that color to their appropriate crossing at the crossing. The entire area is separated off by this little gray zone here. All of those mixing zones is a, an additional texture material exposed aggregate strip that is a warning strip to pedestrians and cyclists alike. You are entering a different place. Pay attention. Uh, <clears throat> so considerations on this. This is a dramatic urban reconfiguration. So the expectations that everyone had, whether they're drivers, whether they're cyclists, whether they're walking, whether they use the orange line, it's all different. You can access the orange line from a totally different spot. New places, new expectations, people are going to want to know where to go. It's a new parkway concept. There's been a mode shift here. Parkways used to be all about the car. This one is really about the pedestrians and cyclists getting through there. There's the new subway connection link. There's park use and transportation use, mixing zones, and total different expectations going on there. And then there's the reconnections of the city itself. Of course, maintenance as well. So, right. Moving on, the second part of the conversation, I have about three minutes here, but I want to walk through briefly. Um, I mentioned having a comfort zone, references that experts, designers can go to. The federal, all the way from USDOT down to MassDOT, 
uh, MBTA, looking at issues, trying to get better guidance so everybody can get on the same page. Nixon made the observation that whereas uh, crash fatalities from vehicles has been falling off, crash fatalities from pedestrians and cyclists has been gradually creeping up. And so they developed this action plan, Safer People, Safer Streets, with abundance of initiatives and publications and research priorities, one of which is the very soon to come out FHWA publication on separated bike lane planning and design. And this is, uh, we're hoping to see this out, uh, I get a preview, we in a, at uh, Mass got a preview of this. Uh, the purpose of the document, it really what it is, it catalogs the experience of uh, cycle tracks nationwide, different strategies they've done, different kinds of flexibility, and it includes an analysis of how successful these different methods have been. What they broke it into is sort of a four-step design process of consideration. I'll walk through these. Uh, starting with selecting direction and width of cycle tracks and protected uh, or the separated bike lanes. Uh, what kind of separation, what kind of mechanisms, whether they're delineator posts, landscaping, concrete barriers, a whole variety of possibilities evaluated how well they work. And then looking at the mid-block considerations, driveways, but not just driveways, loading zones, bus stops, things like that. Handicap parking, this is just a, a sample. And then finally, of course, um, how do you deal with the intersections? And just a series of different strategies for addressing intersections. So that's the Federal Highway guy. Mass Dot's getting its own. It's a little bit different. The um, Federal Highway Guide is kind of a planning document, sort of strategically mapping out how these things might go on the street. The Mass Dot document, which I'm hearing may be available early in 2015. Got our fingers crossed on this. Thank you, Lou. Um, this is to provide necessary design guides to provide design separated bike lanes and construction. This one is a design guide. It's looking at the whole gamut from user needs, design type vehicles, different kinds of bicycles, street types, horizontal alignment, cross slope, but I'm not done. Drainage, lighting, curb ramp, pavement parking, the works, right down to the transit accommodations because that's an integral part of this, it's an integral part of what this presentation is about. Uh, I got a few samples of the uh, graphics that are going to be in there. I'm told that there are more coming. They're going to be three-dimensional graphics so you can get a full feel of what's going on. Drainage considerations. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, our Complete Streets, Lou, Rovito, and others have been working in conjunction with the MBTA with the development of bus stop design guidelines. This too is in draft February. And this one, again, full gamut of uh, best placement, what the fleet looks like, amenities, shelters, the gamut. This is being integrated into that highway design guide. And that's my wrap. Thank you very much.